Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth and we do receive it. We thank you for the revelation that you're bringing forth. Thank you for all that you accomplished this night. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been sharing with you on subjects relating to end time events and especially about things that you and I need to be aware of uh, to know what is going on in these days. We've talked about in the last couple times, we talked about God's set times revealing the exact timing of end time events. And this morning we talked about, do you know what time it is in God's earth? And if you don't know what time it is, you're in trouble because you won't realize what is about to come and what you need to be doing in your life. Well, tonight we're going to talk about another important message relating to end time events, and that is the revelation of the seventh month in the Word of God. We know that the Bible talks about, in Leviticus 23, the Feast of the Lord, and there are seven feasts. They're not Jewish feasts or Old Testament feasts. They're God's feasts, and they're all revelation of the work of Jesus Christ. The first four feasts are in the beginning of the year and, and the first month and the third month, and they've been fulfilled by Jesus in his first coming. The last three feasts are at the seventh month of the year, which we're going to be talking about the revelation of the seventh month, because there's many things that are important for you to know. And these feasts are trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles, but it also speaks of the completed work that God will accomplish in the body of Christ to bring the body of Christ, those, the remnant, those who will follow him to the place of perfection, to be the glorious church, the mighty end time army of the Lord that will accomplish the things that he purposes. We begin, as we talk about the revelation of the seventh month, <coughs> in Genesis chapter eight, verse four. It says, the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. This is after the flood had occurred and after God had destroyed all that he had created up to that time except for Noah and his family and those he'd brought of the creation that he brought into the ark. And so here after the flood, it said it rested in the seventh month. Now that's significant because the seventh month speaks of this mighty work of God being accomplished to bring forth his freedom and liberty for man, bring judgment upon the world, and also to bring forth the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And it was on the seventh day of the month, that is during the time of tabernacles. And here we see it was on the mountains of Ararat. Ararat means the curse reversed. And this is talking about what Jesus is going, to, what came to accomplish. And after the flood destroyed the first group, well, God now is going to work to reverse the curse, and it's going to be through the sending of his son, Jesus Christ, that he was going to accomplish this great work. And the seventh month, 17th day, here, 17, is this number that refers to the, being, uh, the ending of evil or overcoming of evil in the earth. And God was set forth to overcome the evil in the earth and it's all, all going to be through Jesus Christ. <laughs> we see this word, this number 17, is significant in several places, but we're going to look at one scripture in Jeremiah chapter 32. In Jeremiah chapter 32, this is where, in verse 6 and following, Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hanamiel, that means God is gracious. The son of Shalom, which means retribution, which is to pay back and bring recompense against the enemy that has stolen and has caused the problems that we have in the earth. Of course, man's rebellion opened the door. But he was supposed to use the authority given unto him and to conquer and to guard the garden, remember, from any intruders. Unfortunately, he disobeyed and spiritual death came upon mankind and the lease of the rule and reign over the earth was given into the hands of Satan, who now became the god of this age, of the 6,000 year age of man's rule and reign on the earth, this lease that was given unto him. He said, as thy uncle shall come unto thee, saying, buy my, thee my field, which is an Anathoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. Anathoth 
speaks of the place of affliction, and it all points towards the earth that was in affliction because of the fall of man, because of evil, and because of sin. Notice he speaks of this rite of redemption. And so Canamiel, the son, the monocle son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of God, because he was in prison. Jeremiah is a type of man being a spiritual prison to the devil. He said to me, By my field, I pray thee, that's in Anathoth, in the place of affliction, which is in the country of Benjamin. Benjamin means the son of the right hand. Well, that means it belongs to the Lord. For the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption, or this means the right of redemption, the word gula, is thine, buy it for thyself. So that means this one had the right of inheritance, and he also had the right of redemption, and he was going to buy it. Well, when he learned this, he said, then I knew that this was the word of the Lord, because he was going to be buying it for the Lord. So... He bought the field of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, it was an Anathoth, weighed him the money, 17 shekels of silver. 17, the number of the overcoming and the ending of evil. And this purchase of what was a, a, the land in affliction, which is a type of the earth in affliction, done to end the evil for the 17, the number of 17 shekels of silver, and this was done, and a title deed was then given. He said in verse 10, I subscribed the evidence, sealed it, took witnesses, and weighing him the money in the balances. I took the evidence the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom, and that which was open. And so he gave the evidence to them, and this is before all the Jews, everybody saw this. Now this was a title deed, and it's the title deed to the earth that now was purchased, and it then was put in an earthen vessel for many, many days, it said. Of course, that would be until the time when Jesus, who has the right of redemption, the right of inheritance, comes to loose the seals of the title deed to take back the earth that was in affliction, this title deed having already been purchased by Jeremiah for him. So this speaks of the seventh month, and when is this all going to happen? When Jesus is going to accomplish this great work, completing this work, and the seventh month, he's going to bring the judgment upon the nations, which is the Day of Atonement is one of the feasts at that time, and that's going to be the judgment upon the nations. And also then the Feast of Tabernacles, where he comes to Tabernacle, and one of those fulfillments is when he comes to establish the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, having taken back the earth and beginning to rule in the 7,000 year period. The first fulfillment actually of this, of the seventh month, was the birth of Jesus Christ. We know this when we see in Luke chapter 2, the time of the birth of Jesus. Luke 2, 1, It came to pass in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Now, this taxing was made, Cyrenius was the governor of Syria. All went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth and to Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of, of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. So she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger. Why? Because there was no room for them in the inn. The manger was a stall where they kept animals. <laughs> there was no room for him in the inn. Why was that? Because this is the time of tabernacles. This is the time when the feasts of the Lord were in the seventh month and the fall feasts. And this is the time then everybody had taken the rooms in the inn and there was no more room. Well, we see the fact that this is also the time when the tax, the world was taxed, which was at the end of the harvest season. No room for them in the end, the time of tabernacles, laid in a, a manger, which is like a temporary dwelling place, which is what tabernacles is all about, because they built booths, which were temporary dwelling places, pointing towards the fact that you and I are in a temporary dwelling place in this body. We're going to get a new body. 
and also even in a temporary dwelling place in this earth because there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And also, the shepherds were out in the field at the time. In the same country, shepherds were abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Uh, they were out in the field there before the rainy season came. The rainy season in Israel was from, Fe from November to February, so this is prior to that. And so here, this shows that no way was Jesus born at December 25th. That's a lie. Remember, that was appointed the birth of Jesus by the pagans uh, deal that Constantine put together to please the pagans whose birthday of the unconquered sun god was December 25th. So they appointed this, and the Roman Catholic Church was involved in this, in order to appoint this to please the pagans and bring them into the Roman Church, which had church Christians as well as pagans. Of course, it was backslid pretty much at that time. And in doing so, they appointed that day the birthday of Jesus, but it's not. The birthday of Jesus was in the fall at the time of tabernacles. Because of the tax, because of the shepherds still out in the field, because of no room in the inn, because it was tabernacles and all the rooms were, were taken. And they, during the rainy season, which would have been right December 25th, right in the middle of that, they wouldn't have been traveling at all. The manger stall, which is like a temporary dwelling place, a sukkot, which is the booths. And also, the fact that one other scripture we had to look at to show you this, it makes it real clear in John 1.14. The Word was made flesh and dwell among us. The word dwell is the word skenoo, which means to tabernacle. Well, that makes it pretty clear. God was showing us that this is when he was born at the time of tabernacles, as he came as the first fulfillment of tabernacles. So Jesus was the first fulfillment of that. But then we see further that when he came into his ministry, that was a further fulfillment of what the seventh month was all about. We go to Leviticus chapter 25. In Leviticus chapter 25, we pick up in verse 9. He says, Thou shalt cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, in the day of atonement. Shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land? This was the seventh month, tenth day. This is the day of judgment. And this is the day when the high priest had to go in on that very day and pour out the blood on the mercy seat, which was a covering over for sin, not a doing away with it. And he had to do it every year because this was the day of judgment. Well, this also was a time, speaking here, the trumpet of the Jubilee on this day of declaring freedom from all bondages where the judgment would come upon the nations and upon the enemy and everybody would go free from all of the bondages having been set free from Satan's control and operations. We see that you'll hollow the 50th year, proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto the inhabitants. It was a time of proclaiming liberty. It was a jubilee unto you. You return every man to his possession, every turn every man to his family. Jubilee that 50th year be unto you. So it was every 50 years they had a jubilee. The jubilee shall be holy unto you. You shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. And in verse 13 he said, In the year of the jubilee you return every man unto his possession. Well, this was what Jesus Christ was going to do to liberate us from captivity to the enemy. And we see it's spoken about him coming at this time in Isaiah chapter 61. In Isaiah chapter 61, it says, and this is speaking about Jesus, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. What was the acceptable year of the Lord? That was the year of Jubilee when they would be free. This is every 50 years, pointing towards the time when man was going to be totally free from Satan's control over mankind and come to the place, of course, of restoration to, of all things, and coming into relationship with the Father, of course, through Jesus, but also the restoration of all things that had been lost. 
Now, this is where we stop at the moment here because we're going to go over to Luke chapter 4 and see that this is exactly what Jesus did in Luke chapter 4 in verse 18 when he was at Nazareth. And it says in verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. He came to bring the liberty of the Jubilee in his ministry that he began. And he said also to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he stopped. That was where he stopped. It says he closed up the book, gave it back to the minister. Was that the end of what was said? Well, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 61. We read verse 1, verse 2, where he proclaimed the acceptable year of the Lord. But what else? And the day of vengeance of our God. Well, why wasn't that added on? Because Jesus, in his first coming, came to bring forth the gospel, to bring salvation, to bring forth healing and deliverance, to bring forth liberty and set captives free. He didn't come to bring his judgment or his vengeance, the vengeance of our God. Well, when is that going to be fulfilled? That is fulfilled in the second coming of Jesus Christ, which he will accomplish. Now, in coming at this time, we want to see, well, was this, what does this have to do with the seventh month? Well, when we look over here in chapter 3 of Luke, and we come down to verse 21. Here's when all the people were being baptized. And verse 22, the Holy Ghost descended a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Remember, Jesus was baptized. And then the Holy Spirit came upon him. And here he's declared to be his Son who God was well pleased in the Father. And it says here, Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, and it goes on through the entire messianic lineage uh, back to the time of, of uh, through, to Adam, to, to God. And so here it says he was about 30 years, and that's the time when you entered into ministry. Well, after this, what happened? In Luke chapter 4, we see what happened. Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. After he was baptized, then he went into the, led by the Holy Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And so he'd be in 40 days tempted of the devil after accomplishing, of course, the victory in every one of the temptations. Then we come down to verse 14. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him throughout all the region about. So the baptism and then the going forth to be tempted, this was all done before he started his ministry. Then we come to verse 15. He taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. This means that he had started his ministry at this point because when he had started his ministry, he was teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and going forth. Remember, it was to preach the glad tidings, the good news. Well, then he comes to Nazareth. And this is where he stood up and he went in the synagogue and that's where it was given to him, Isaiah 61, and where he read it, the first part where it talks about his first coming. Well, one of the things we need to realize after he got this, the book and had read this down, it says he closed the book, gave it to the minister, sat down, eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And then we come to verse 21 and he says... This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. When he says it's fulfilled, is he talking about that very day it was fulfilled? No, because he's talking about this has been fulfilled. He's declaring to them that at that point in time, it had been fulfilled. The reason why we say that is because it's a perfect tense verb. Not that it is fulfilled that day, but it has been fulfilled the perfect tense meaning action accomplished in the past with present results at the time of speaking. So it had been fulfilled sometime prior to where he's speaking. And what is he speaking here? He's speaking 
on the sab the Saturday Sabbath there, which was his custom when he came into Nazareth. And we know his ministry had already started. Well, we go over to Mark's account in chapter 1, and we pick up in verse 13 where he was tempted for the 40 days, it says, tempted of Satan, and the angels ministered to him when that was done. And then in verse 14, now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And that was the beginning of his ministry. Here we see the beginning of his ministry as well. And what does he say after that? And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. What time is he talking about? The word time is a fixed, definite time. And this is Jesus now coming and he is preaching this jubilee gospel of the kingdom of liberty, bringing liberty to the people, preaching the gospel, casting out the demons, healing the sick throughout his earthly ministry. He said the time, the specific, fixed, definite time has been fulfilled and the kingdom of God is now brought near. Repent and believe the gospel. So what's he talking about? He's talking about the time fulfilled for him to begin his ministry. And this was the fulfillment of Isaiah 61, which was the time of the Day of Atonement fulfillment in the first coming, the first aspect of it, which was to bring liberty. Because what was the time of, of the Jubilee? It was the seventh month, tenth day. Jesus would have started his ministry on the seventh month, tenth day. In 26 AD, when he began his ministry, that day was on a Wednesday. Then he was, of course, at the Nazareth on a Saturday, the Saturday Sabbath, which very well may have been three days later. It doesn't say exactly when. It was either on the three days later, on the 13th day of that month, or it could have been the week before, after that. More than likely, though, the three days after that. But, and he had said, remember, that it already has been fulfilled, which means when was the time fulfilled? On the 10th day of the seventh month, Jesus began his ministry. So the seventh month here speaks of the ministry of Jesus in the earth in his first coming where he begins to operate in ministry, to preach the gospel, to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to set the captives free and carry out the work that he was called to do in the first com coming. Of course, he accomplished that. The second fulfillment of that is the vengeance of our God and that will come also at that time on the seventh month, tenth day, which is the day of atonement, the day of judgment, which will be the judgment that will come upon the nations. We see another place about the seventh month. It's in John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verse 2, says, Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. Well, that was one of the feasts in the seventh month. It was the third feast of the seventh month. And it says this is the time when this was at hand. And what do we see going on? We come down to verse 6. Jesus said, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready to go up to this feast. Now when he says the time is not yet come, what's he talking about? The fixed, definite time, which would have been his time to go up to that feast. It was for him to fulfill that. And it wasn't his time at this point. He was, of course, going to fulfill this at a later time. But Jesus came in his first coming, remember, to accomplish all this liberty. But he didn't come to, he was initially born, of course, at the time of tabernacles. But he was going to come, this is talking about when he comes and brings his millennial reign, the reign of Jesus Christ. Now, we see in verse 8, he says this, Go up into the feast, I go not up yet in this feast, for my time is not yet full come. Well, this also not only speaks of him coming to bring this millennial reign into manifestation, but it also speaks of the end time work in the church to bring it to maturity, to bring it to be the perfected church, the glorious church that would be pouring out the rivers of water flowing out, which is what is the fulfillment of the work of God accomplished in the church, the remnant who will follow him, the perfected church, the glorious church, and that happens right at the end of the church age. We see here that 
He said, My time is not yet fully come. So we come down to verse 10. When his brethren were gone up, then when he also up under the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Now what's he doing here? He now is revealing what he does in the fulfillment of the ministry to the church to bring it to the place of perfection. And notice, this is in the midst of this, so this would speak of during the latter part of the fulfillment of the work of God in the church to bring it to perfection and be the glorious church, which it will be. Because Jesus is going to present to himself a church that's holy, a glorious church, without spot, without wrinkle, and the glorious the glory of God is going to be poured out on the end time church mightier and more greater than what was on the former church, the early church. So this is coming. And Jesus now, he goes up in the feast, not openly, but as, as it is in secret. This means the fact that he's not going to come with some big, wide open revival. No, he's going to come to every person to see who's going to walk in the ways of the Lord and who's not, as well as coming to every nation. The nations are going to be shaken, and he is going to come to every nation to see who will turn to him and who will be one of the nations that will be saved. Well, we come down to verse 14. About the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. What's the temple? There was, of course, a temple, physical temple there at that time. But this particular, we're, of course, pointing towards what he does in the body of Christ. He's coming into the temple, and who's that? We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That means he's coming into the church. And what's he going to do? He's going to teach. He's going to teach the true doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ that needs to be brought forth to eliminate all the false doctrines. Remember, in the last days, it talks about the deceiving spirits and the doctrines of devils. Well, doctrines of doctrines of devils have to be exposed and the true teaching of Jesus Christ has to come forth. And so he comes in the midst of this feast into the temple, it's coming into the church, and teaching the word of God, teaching the truth. We come to verse 17. Jesus answered and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. He's teaching the true doctrine from the Father. And he says, Any man, if any man will, that's the main verb in this clause. We can see this because it is a present tense verb and a subjunctive mood, which is what it would be if any man may be willing, the way you would translate it. Do is, is an infinitive here, <clears throat> as you will see. It's an infinitive. An infinitive in the Greek is translated just as the English one would be. If any man may be willing to do his will. Well, that's significant. You must be willing to do his will as you hear the word of God. He shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. What does that tell you? That means the guy who's just the casual inquirer or just kind of wanting to know some facts but not committing to do the word, is he going to get the true doctrine? No, he's not going to know the doctrine. Who is going to get the true doctrine? The ones who are willing to do it, they're going to incorporate, not just hearers only. Remember, the hearers only, they build their house on a sand, and the storms and attacks of the enemy come, and they have a great fall. It's the hearers and the doers that build their foundation on a rock. It's established, and they won't be shaken. The hearers and the doers are going to know the true doctrine. Verse 18, He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Now that also tells us something. We can't be speaking, looking for our own glory, uh, seeking our own glory and speaking of ourselves. That's all out of selfishness and out of pride. No, we're going to seek his glory because we're going to seek him and be totally submissive and yielded unto him. We live unto him now. We don't live unto ourselves and we totally submit and yield ourselves unto him. Remember, we're bought with a price. And those who are going to be doing the word are the ones who are going to come to know the truth. We can even see this declared back in John chapter 3, verse 21. He that doeth truth, the word doeth, is a present tense verb, as we see, Present tense means continuous, ongoing action. 
So he who is continually doing truth cometh to the light. Well, that guy means the guy who's just hearing it. That doesn't mean he necessarily comes to the light. It's the guy who's doing the truth comes to the light. What else do we see about someone who's continuing in doing the word or continuing in the word of God? John 8, 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews that believed on him, if you continue in my word, that's the condition, continue abiding, remaining in it. That means you're going to be hearing and doing it consistently. Then are you my disciples indeed. And then what's going to happen? You'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. God wants every one of us to be free, but we need to get the word, hear it, do it, incorporate it into our lifestyle. The Christians that just hear the word, but they don't take hold of it to incorporate it in their lifestyle, they're just hearers only, and that's a mistake. That's why we need to get the word in us and walk in it and be doers of the word consistently to see accomplish the great work. You see, Jesus is coming to the temple, the church, and he's going to teach it. And he's not coming openly, but he's coming in secret as we see. And what is he coming to do? He's coming to bring his healing, deliverance, restoration work, and he's coming to bring us the true teaching so we take hold of the word of God and hear and do it and come to the place of freedom and liberty. Because how does he work? Through the word. It's through the word in you. That's, of course, the one who's going to be doing the word that he hears. He set himself to do it. That's the one who's going to know the truth. So this brings forth the revelation, the fact that the seventh month speaks of this work of bringing truth to the church, bringing forth the full ministry of Jesus Christ to bring it to the place of freedom and liberty, healed, healed delivered, set free, and walking in the truth, growing up, to going on to perfection in the Lord is, going, is coming forth in these last days, and it speaks of it here in the seventh month. Another thing that we see is the fact that over in 2 Chronicles chapter 31, it speaks about the tithes and offerings that were being brought into the, into the, uh, the temple, there, Hezekiah, this is the time of Hezekiah, and it comes down to verse 5 here. They were bringing them all, all these ties in, and then verse 6, and then we come to verse 7, and it says, in the third month, they began to lay the foundation of the heaps. This is the heaps of, from the tithes and offerings that were being brought in, and finished them in the seventh month. Well, what's significant about this? The third month is Siwan, which is the time of Pentecost. That's the beginning of the church age. The seventh month is Tishri, and that is the end of the church age. It is a four-month period from the third month to the seventh month, which is when Jesus comes back and accomplishes his work in the second coming. So the third to the seventh month speaks of the church age. And what are they doing? They're tithing. This shows you the fact that tithing is for the New Testament era. There have been, unfortunately, many in the body of Christ who have thought that we don't tithe in the New Testament. They are totally deceived. They have believed doctrines of the devil. They have missed the whole boat. They think that it was just something for the Old Testament law and not in the New Testament era. That is a lie. First of all, we see that that Abel was tithing. He brought the firstlings of his flock, which was the tithe. And then we see also that Abraham tithe. And we see also that Isaac tithe. They were bringing their tithes. This all predated the law. And then it continued during the time of the Old Testament law. It never changed. You know, God's the, he says, I, I don't change. He hadn't changed in the way he does things. Well, we see over in Hebrews chapter 7, in verse 8, it says, here men that die receive tithes, talking about men on earth. There he receiveth them, of whom it's witness that he liveth. Who is the one that's witness that he liveth? There's only one person, Jesus, the one who's been raised from the dead. There, where is there? That's where he is now, in heaven. It shows it for here, which is in this place, as opposed to there, in another place. And there is where Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. And what happens? As you bring your tithes, Jesus, our high priest, takes it 
and sets it before the Father because it comes through the high priestly ministry. And so this is speaking of that as we bring of our tithes today to men in the flesh, that also Jesus is receiving it in the Spirit in heaven and sets it before the Father. And then, of course, he looks down from his holy habitation and pours out his blessings upon us. Those ones who think that tithing is not for today have been deceived if they think it's passed away. In fact, we mentioned about in Genesis about Abel bringing the tithe, as we see. Abel brought the first lings. This is the birthright offering, the right of the firstborn offering. And the fat there, which was the best, and this was the tithe. He brought that. God had respect to his offering, but not to, Ab not to Cain, so of course. And look what also it says. It points out that this problem of people not tithing would happen in the end, end days. Because it says, in the process of time it came to pass. Not a good translation. Watch when I put the cursor over the word process. It is the word meaning end, translated end, and it refers to the end of time, end. The reason is of time because the next word is, is time, which is referring to actually days, because this is plural in the Hebrew. That's why Young's translates it correctly. It cometh to pass at the end of days. Oh, what is that telling you? That is prophetic of something that's going to happen at the very end. And that is that Cain would just bring the fruit of, an all, of the ground and offering, whatever he wanted to do unto the Lord. Well, we see this happening even today. Deceived Christians who are not bringing the tithe. The tithe belongs to God it is the tenth, the first tenth of the increase. And one who does not bring it to him, he's robbing God and the whole nation, which would be the church, the holy nation. So tithes and offerings were brought in, and notice there were heaps of them when we looked at that in Second Chronicles 31. There'll be abundance for the work of the ministry to carry out all the things that need to be done when the tithes and offerings are brought in to the church in the New Testament era. That which says that tithe, tithing is not for today is a doctrine of the devil. And all these people are in trouble. They are going to give account to God for their rejection of the truth of tithing, which has always been from the beginning and continues on until now. We see also about the seventh month when we come to Ezra chapter 3. Remember the seventh month is showing forth the revelation of the work of God accomplished in the church, as well as the end-time work of Jesus in, in his second coming. Ezra chapter 3, verse 1. When the seventh month was come, uh, you see that, you pay attention to it. The children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. One man. That meant they come in one accord. And that's what's going to happen. The church is going to come in one accord, at the end to be the perfected church. And this is because, because they're going to get the true teaching of the Word of God. Jerusalem means the teaching of peace. And peace is talking about shalom, which is talking about not just peace of mind, it's talking about prosperity, it's talking about healing, it's talking about safety, preservation, um, all the types of aspect of, of what this full salvation of the Lord would bring forth. So. Here they gather themselves as one to Jerusalem, the teaching of peace. And he's speaking about how this is going to come forth in the seventh month, a revelation that the, the church will come to the place of having the true teaching that will produce the total victory and the total salvation in all aspects in our life, and that we will come in one accord. Well, we see in verse 6, from the first day of the seventh month, began they to offer the burnt offerings and the to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple was not yet laid. This shows this is going to be a process of seeing this come to pass. The foundation hadn't been laid yet. Well, they begin to set forth that work. In verse 8, it speaks at the latter part of this verse where it speaks about the remnant, and that's the ones who will do this work, the obedient ones, the few that are following the way of the Lord. It says here in the latter part of this verse to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. You and I are to do this work of seeing the house of the Lord 
the building of the things of God, you and I are to be being built up a spiritual house, seeing God's building be accomplished in our life. And we see now in verse 10, here when the builders laid the foundation, the temple of the Lord, ah, that means the foundation was laid. And how is the foundation laid? By being a hearer and a doer of the word in our life. This speaks of the fact that the, those ones that'll come in one accord are going to be hearers and doers of the word and see the foundation laid. And notice, they set the priests in their apparel, that means in their clothing, with trumpets and the Levites here, they were praising and worshiping God. So here the foundation was laid. They had their clothing on, which means who? The priests. What are you and I, priests? What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to put the garments of God on and be clothed with all the things of the Word of God. We put on the armor of God. We put on the new man. We put on the Lord Jesus Christ. All these things were to put off the old man. We're to put on these things. Put on the armor of light, the things it says that we're to put on. You, that speaks of the body of Christ coming to the place of putting on the whole armor of God, all the things of the clothing, the spiritual clothing of the Lord Jesus Christ being put upon us. And so they were set in this. We come to chapter 4. Now, when you start seeing God do a work in your life, is the enemy going to just sit by idly and just watch this happen? No. He's going to come after you because he comes for the word's sake to try to take it out. Remember, the devil comes immediately to try to take the word out of your heart when, it, when you've heard it. He didn't want it to stay there. Well, Ezra 4.1, Now the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel. As you hear and do the word, which is what is happening in the end time church for those who are putting the word first place to grow up in all things, it is building the spiritual temple in your life. Oh, when they heard it, enemies, the adversaries were upset. They came to try to stop it. And they said, they come first of all and say, let us build with you. And of course, they weren't going to give place to that. They said, no, you have nothing to do with us in building this house. In other words, you must always be ready to guard yourself against anything that the devil would bring against you to try to disrupt the building of God in your life through you hearing and doing the Word. He'll try to get you not to do the Word, not to hear the Word. Go off in some other direction. Get busy with all these other projects. Do all these other things instead of put your priorities in order. Well, they unfortunately were successful, and the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in the building. Well, they weren't getting the building done. You must not let the devil get to you and weaken you and trouble you and hinder you in the building of God in your life. You need to be about the work of hearing and doing the word to build your spiritual house so you become strong and victorious and possess promises and overcome in all areas of life. Here it says in verse 5, they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purposes. That shows you the devil will try to come and frustrate the work of God in your life. And they were able to do it all the days of Cyrus, the king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, the king of Persia. They did it for a long time. It's amazing, some Christians have allowed the devil to stop their spiritual growth because they haven't put the Word of God first place in their life. They haven't been hearers and doers of the Word. Well, we must come to the place of doing the Word of God to see this work be accomplished in us. In fact, they got to the place, look at Ephesians, or uh, Ezra 4, 24. Then ceased the work of God, work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. It ceased, it stopped. Don't ever let the work of God stop in your life. Consistently be in the Word, hearing the Word, studying the Word, doing it, applying it in your life, carrying out the things that God wants for you. Well, then in chapter 5, verse 1, the prophets Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, they prophesied in the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem to get them straight. Remember, they, the prophets would bring the word of the Lord to them. And so the things that they said were what they needed to hear in order to get them on track and start doing the building again. And so they did. In verse 2, as they began to build the house of God again, as the, the prophets were speaking the word of the Lord to them, encouraging them in the things that they were supposed to do. 
God wants you to get the word in you. The word will always encourage you to build the things of God. It will always encourage you to hear and do the word, overcome enemies, conquer all areas of sin, and to be delivered, healed, set free, possess promises, always to walk in the ways of the Lord. And that's what he wants. We come over to Nehemiah. So this speaks of the end time work being done in the body of Christ. Nehemiah 7. We come to verse 73 at the end of this chapter. Here it says, The priests, the Levites, the porters, singers, some of the people, Nethans, all Israel dwelt in their cities when the seventh month came. Ah, this is the seventh month again, showing the end time work in the body of Christ. The children of Israel were in their cities. Verse 1 of chapter 8. All the people gathered themselves together as one man. Here we see this coming as one, one accord into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses. The end time work, the body of Christ, will come to the place of being in one accord as one man and will want to hear the word of God. They wanted Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses. We, of course, are under the New Testament. The law has changed, remember. We are now under the law of Christ. And so we now are to walk after the commandments and the sayings of Jesus Christ, the laws that are of Christ that are set in the New Testament. Well, as they began to hear the word, they came, they wanted to get understanding. It says in verse 2, All that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month, they came to get understanding of the word of God. That's what God wants for every Christian. He wants you to have a heart that's seeking after getting understanding, to understand the ways of the Lord because he wants you to get his revelation of his ways and grow up and become strong and victorious and gain spiritual knowledge, understanding, and wisdom so you walk in all the ways of the Lord. Now, oh, these guys, they put the word first place. Look at what it says. Verse 3. And he, heard, read, and he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. Well, morning... This is talking about the light of day right at the beginning of it, when the day was dawning at daybreak. Until midday, this would have been the time of noon. Well, that's six hours. These guys were in the Word, hearing the Word. They wanted to hear it for six hours. But men and women and those that could understand, the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. They wanted to understand it. We come down to verse 7. It speaks here of these ones and Levite ones who caused the people to understand the law. The people stood in their place. Hey, they were attentive. They didn't want to be denied. They wanted to get the understanding. The true remnant, the true ones who are the few that are putting God first place in the end time church, they're going to grow up and go on to perfection, are the ones who want the word. And they are going to seek after the hearing and doing the word, putting it in operation in their life. And they wanted to get the understanding. So they read in the book of the law distinctly, verse 8, gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. The book of the law distinctly, this means that it was going to be declared to them clearly and accurately so they would understand the word of God. Well, that's what God wants. That's why we've got to be hearing the word of God. What does God want any person who is teaching the word to be doing? Well, they need to be wise, wise preachers. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 9 says, Moreover, because the preacher was wise, he taught the people knowledge. What should every person who is teaching the Word, every pastor, every person who's teaching in some capacity, he should be teaching the people knowledge, the Word. Not just tell them stories, not tell them their opinions, not just carrying on about all kinds of stuff. No, teaching them the Word. Now, how are they going to get this knowledge? Yea, he gave good heed, the preacher did, sought out and set in order the many proverbs. Well, that means he's going to have to study every scripture on every subject and set in order the many proverbs on each subject. And the preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. So what's the preacher supposed to be bringing forth? The Word of God. Scripture after scripture after scripture, bringing knowledge, bringing forth words of truth, those are the acceptable words that should be brought forth. Not this 
pump me up stuff, preachy stuff that we see that ministers are doing today, they have missed the boat. Instead, you are to be getting the word in you and teaching the people knowledge, sharing the word of God, bringing revelation. The preacher is going to preach the words of truth to them. What do we see? We see many places where, unfortunately, a pastor or a teacher will just take a text, a scripture or two, and then just give a talk after that. Well, what happened to scripture after scripture after scripture, words of truth, acceptable words coming continually? We have a problem. All pastors, all teachers, all who are in the ministry should be bringing forth the word of God to the people, not just rambling on or giving these type of messages that make people feel good type of things. No. It should be the Word of God coming forth, Scripture after Scripture, distinctly teaching it, explaining it, and teaching it clearly so the people get the understanding. We also see, and this is happening, going to happen in the seventh month fulfillment in the body of Christ. Nehemiah chapter 8. Again, we were there, how they were just hearing the Word, and we come down to verse 18. And look what it says. Also, day by day, from the first day until the last day, he read in the book of the law of God. Here's where they were keeping the feast seven days, and the eighth day was the solemn assembly according to the, according to the manner. This is talking about tabernacles. Tabernacles is the last feast. And this is speaking of the fulfillment of the end time work in the body of Christ to mature it, to bring it to perfection, so it grows up and becomes the mighty army of the Lord, for the glory of God to be poured out at the end. Notice, they're from day to day, day after day after day after day. They're reading the book of the law. They want to hear the word of God. And then we come over to Nehemiah chapter 9. Here in verse 2, where these ones, the seed of Israel, separated themselves from all the strangers, stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. Hey, they wanted to deal with everything in their life and get rid of everything that was not of the Lord. And this was in when? Verse 1. In the 24th day of the month, this month, the children of Israel were assembled with the fasting and sackcloth. This is of the seventh month. Well, this means after they've heard the word of God, now what they do? They wanted to put it in operation, and they wanted to get rid of, separate themselves from strangers, get rid of the deal with the sins, iniquities of their forefathers. That means they're working out their own salvation and dealing with all sin areas in their life. That is what the body of Christ is supposed to do to grow up in the things of God. And first, verse, verse 3, look what it says. They stood up in their place, read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one-fourth part of the day, and another fourth part they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. Well, if we're talking about the day being just the day time period, that would be 12 hours, one-fourth of 12 hours, that's three hours a day studying the Word of God, three hours a day confessing and worshipping the Lord. Hey, they're spending six hours a day at a minimum studying the Word of God, and ministering to the Lord and doing the things that God says. Those in the end time remnant, the body of Christ, who are going to see this completed work be accomplished, which is what this work of Jesus is bringing forth in the seventh month in those who will listen to him, that's, they're going to be ones, people that are going to be of the word. They're going to be in the word, hearing the word, learning the word, doing the word, walking in it, worshiping God, doing all the things that he wants them to do. This is, and notice, every one of these, it all had to do with the Word in them. If you won't put the Word of God first place and learn the Word, what are you doing with your life? There is a problem. You need to be putting your priorities in order. At the same time, we come over to Jeremiah chapter 28. Jeremiah 28, verse 17, we'll read first. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. When you see the seventh month, that has some prophetic significance for the end times. Well, this is a prophet. He died at the very end. This must speak of the fact that there are going to be some people who at least claim there to be prophets to die. Why would they die? Because they are false prophets. 
We see in verse 2, this is what Hananiah was saying. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Uh, you're not going to go into Babylonian captivity. I've broken that bondage, and so you're going to be free. Within two full years will I bring again into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house. Uh, two years, and it'll all be over. It wasn't. It was 70 years they were in Babylon. This guy was not prophesying the truth. He was declaring things that weren't the truth. Verse 5, Jeremiah comes and says, Under the prophet Hananiah, in the presence of the priests, in the presence of all the people that stood in the house of the Lord, he's confronting him, and he says, uh, the Lord do so. The Lord perform thy words which thou hast prophesied to bring again the vessels of the Lord's house and all that's carried away captive from Babylon, Babylon into this place. And he comes down to verse 9. He says, The prophet which prophesies of peace, when the word of the Lord shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord tr hath truly sent him. In other words, if the guy says that something's going to come to pass, it's got to come to pass. If it doesn't come to pass, then there's a problem. Well, Hananiah the prophet took this, took this yoke from off the prophet Jeremiah's neck and break it, meaning that his prophecy, he's declaring it's going to be broken within these two years and they're going to be free from this bondage. And he says, he's going to, says it again in verse 11, I'm going to break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, from the neck of all the nations within the space of two years. And so he goes his, prophet Jeremiah goes his way. And the word of the Lord in verse 12 comes to Jeremiah the prophet after that Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make them for yokes of iron. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I put a yoke of iron upon the neck of all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. They shall serve him, and I have given him the beasts of the field also. Otherwise, it wasn't going to just be some two-year little thing. Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee. Ah, you are false. And thou makest this people to trust in a lie. Ah, that was a mistake. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. He was a false prophet. What happened to him? He died. When? In the seventh month. Prophetic of false prophets are going to die in these end times. If they're not speaking things that are correct, there's a problem. In fact, remember, this is prophesied for the end times. In Matthew chapter 24, over in verse 11, Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive, <coughs> shall deceive many. False prophets. Remember, the test of a prophet is it's got to be in line with the Word of God, and also it's got to come to pass. Oh, it says they come and deceive many. We see people that are chasing around prophets today, and it's a big mistake. In fact, in the judgment that was brought in Revelation chapter 2, we see in verse 20, he says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou hast suffered that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, she declared she was one, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed into idols. Oh, these were things that were contrary to the word of God, and they were wrong. The things, anybody that teaches something contrary to the word or something that doesn't come to pass as a prophet declaring something is a false prophet. Well, what's going to happen? I gave her space to repent of her fornication, she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Ah, these guys, they're going to be in the tribulation. They aren't going to be protected whatsoever. And even the ones that follow her, you don't be a follower of false prophets. Verse 23, I will kill her children with death. Children are the ones who follow after someone. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins. This is the soulish realm, the thoughts, feelings, purposes and the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. False prophets will be judged. False prophets will die. That's quite a statement, but this is the Word of God, and it's going to happen in the end times. And there are false prophets who have prophesied things that did not come to pass, 
And there are some that have died, and there'll be others that will die if they do not prophesy right things and repent and get right before the Lord. This is the mark of what is going to happen down the, in the end times. Also, we see another place. We cannot be in compromise for the word of God whatsoever. In 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 25, came to pass in the seventh month, prophetic of the end times, Ishmael, the son of this man Nethaniah, and the son of Elishama, of the seed royal, came and ten men with him and smote Gedaliah that he died. Gedaliah was the governor that Nebuchadnezzar had set over those who were left in Jerusalem. Well, what happened here? Verse 22. As for the people that remain in the land of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, left, even over them he made Gedaliah the, the son of this one. He was the ruler. He was the one over it. Well, what did he do? Verse 24, Gedaliah swore to him to their men and said to him, Fear not to be servants of the Chaldees. Are we supposed to serve the Chaldees or the Babylonians? Dwell on the land, serve the king of Babylon. It shall be well with you. Well, these guys who are walking in sin and idolatry and all kinds of evil things, are we supposed to submit to those that are walking in sin? Absolutely not. Well, what happened to him? He was in compromise and he died. That tells you something. The, the people that are in compromise are going to be in trouble. In fact, what does it tell us about Babylon in Revelation 18? Verse 2, it speaks about Babylon the great fallen. And it tells us in verse 4, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Well, that would be speaking to all Christians. To come out of the ways of Babylon, which are the ways that are contrary to God's ways, opposite to God's ways, lawlessness, unrighteousness, sin, ways of the world, things that are contrary to the word of God is what Babylon is all about. It's total rebellion against God. Did you be not partakers of her sins, if you walk in there with sinful ways, and you receive not of her plagues, which are the judgments that are going to come upon those who walk in sin? Well, this guy got a judgment because he was telling them to submit to the Babylonian sinful ways, and therefore he got killed. What's going to happen? Those people that, will com that compromise for the sinful ways of the world, the sin sinful things, they are going to be judged. Here it talks about the plagues that will come upon them. You must take an uncompromise and stand to do what the Word says. Walk in line with the Word of God. We cannot be giving place to that which is not right. And it's interesting, you can't be in fellowship with those people that are walking in the way of sin. We see too many Christians today that will not draw the line when it comes to dealing with sin in people's lives. Oh, they, they compromise, see. Look what happened here. Jeremiah 40, verse 14. He said unto him, Dost thou certainly know that Baalus, the king of the Ammonites, he's a bad guy, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to slay thee? Otherwise, this guy was going to come and kill Gedaliah. And of course, this is going to be a judgment upon him because of the fact that he was teaching the people to submit to the Babylonian sinful ways, which was wrong. Well, we come to verse chapter 41. What did he do? Here we said it's the seventh month, remember. And what did he do? There they did eat bread together in Mizpah. Oh, they were in fellowship together. This is a guy who's an evil guy, and he's having fellowship with him. What a mistake. What was the result then? He got killed. It said they came and they smote him. Should we be in fellowship with people that are walking in sinful ways? No. Remember, come out of her, my people. Be not partaker of her sins. Otherwise, you'll receive of her plagues. We cannot be in compromise in regards to people that are walking in sin. We're to be separate. We're not to touch the unclean thing or we'd be contaminated. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. We're not supposed to even eat with fornicators or those people that are idolaters or railers or drunkers, the ones that are, are intoxicators, it says in Corinthians. We should be taking a stand for what is right. We come over to 1 Kings. 
In 1 Kings, we see in chapter 7, we come to verse 51, the last verse. So was ended all the work that King Solomon made for the house of the Lord. Solomon's temple is a type of the church, the work being accomplished in the church. And if they were going to dedicate it at this point in time, here's Solomon, he was bringing up the Ark of the Covenant into this, which would be the presence of God coming into the church that's been dedicated. The finished work is what it's a type of, having been accomplished in the church. And notice in verse 2, all the men of Israel assembled themselves in the King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanim. Well, this is the word for, to, referring to the seventh Jewish month, but it's been uh, called Tishri. It was called Tishri after they had gone into the exile in Egypt. But prior to that, it was Ethanim. And Ethanim refers to permanent streams flowing. Ah, and it was in the seventh, this is the seventh month. Well, this means the fact that the temple, which is going to be finished, and they're dedicating the temple, which prophetically points towards the work of God being finished in the end time church. And now, this is in the month, not Tishri, this is the month Ethanim, which refers to the permanent streams flowing forth. Well, what is that all pointing out towards? Well, we'll see it in a moment, but look here. They brought up the ark and all the holy vessels. Well, that's what you and I are to be. You and I are to be holy vessels before the Lord. And what happened? Who are the holy vessels are the ones here, when it comes down to verse 9, there was nothing in the ark to save the two tables of stone which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel. So the ark is the presence of God coming into us. And what's in the ark? Nothing but two tables, two tables of stone. What's that? That's the word of God. So what's supposed to be in you and me? Nothing but the word of God. If you've got all this other stuff, you need to get rid of it. You're to take all the filthiness out. You're to get the Word of God in you. There was nothing but the Word that was in them. And then what happened? It came to pass and the priests were come out of the holy place. The cloud filled the house of the Lord. As you are filled up with the Word of God, what's going to happen? You are going to see the glory of God. The cloud filled the house of the Lord. And what was this? The priest couldn't stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. This is also spoken of over in 2 Chronicles, in chapter 5, same thing. We come down to, we pick up in verse 10, where there was nothing in the ark except for the two tables. And then we come to verse 11, where it speaks about the priests come out of the holy place, for the priests that were present were sanctified. That meant they come to the place of holiness, and the body of Christ is going to come to the place of holiness before the end times, the consecrated, dedicated unto the Lord. Verse 12, it speaks of these ones that were all the Levites and all the singers and everybody and the brethren. They were arrayed in white linen. White linen speaks of righteousness. That meant these guys had the fruits of righteousness. And they were here with 120 priests sounding the trumpets. 120 is the number of a change of age. And this speaks of the change of the end of the church age to the millennial age of Jesus Christ. That's what the 120 always shows, the end of an age. And this is talking about the end time work being accomplished in the church. And of course, what happened? The same thing we saw, that the, these guys came to the place of being one sound, they began to praise and worship God. The singers were as one in one accord. And what happened? Same thing. The glory of the Lord filled the house of God. God is going to have a people who are going to be in one accord that are going to see God accomplish this great and mighty work of the end time church being filled with the glory of God. In fact, we see further down in chapter 7 in verse Nine. When in the eighth day, when they made a solemn assembly, they kept the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast se se seven days. This is the eighth day after the seven days of, of uh, tabernacles have been completed. So this is talking about 
the work's been done, now we're at the end of that. And what happens? The three and twentieth day of the seventh month, they sent the people away into their tents, glad and merry in heart for the goodness of the Lord that it showed unto David, to Solomon, to Israel, his people. Otherwise, the tremendous blessings, the glory of God, they've come to maturity, they've come to be the dedicated church, the perfected church, with the blessings of God coming upon them mightily. And that is what is going to happen. So, he finished this. Solomon finished the house of the Lord. The work is going to be finished in the body of Christ before the end of the church age that we're going to see. And then, we come to verse 13. It's very interesting. It says, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain. Hmm, that's a judgment, isn't it? If I command the locusts to devour the land, that's another judgment. Hmm, that's going on in Africa, isn't it? No rains happen, happen in Australia, happen in different places down in South America. If I sound, send pestilence upon my people, it's a plague. We see a plague. We see sickness, this virus, 250 plus nations. This sounds like a bunch of judgments, doesn't it? Well, he goes on and says, if my people who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. What's going to be the answer to overcoming these judgments? Because these judgments are calling you to repentance. It's judgment under repentance now. And what is supposed to happen? That my people, the church, is to humble themselves, pray, seek his face, turn from their wicked ways. Then God will hear from heaven, forgive our sin, and heal our land, which is what we want to see happen. God is doing a work. He is calling the body of Christ to get right. This is a work from the end time church to bring them to the place of judgment under repentance so he can bring forth what he purposes, to raise them up to be the ch ch tru truly chosen people. Look at verse 16. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever. Ah, that's what happened. And that's what is to happen in the body of Christ, the end time church. Mine eyes, my heart will be there perpetually. Why? That's because God has come into you. God is now in your midst. God is now manifesting himself. And what is going to happen here? As we see in John chapter 7, we come to verse 37. The last day, day, the last day of the great day of the feast, that's the eighth day of tabernacles, the very end. When the church has come to perfection, the finished work is accomplished, righteousness, holiness, sanctified, dedicated, come to the place of perfected maturity. Look what he says. The last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. What's he talking about? He that believeth me on the scripture is said, Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Well, that's what ethanem was about. Ethanem was permanent streams flowing. Well, that sounds like rivers of living water. That is what is supposed to happen. When? In the seventh month, ethanem. And that's to be manifest in the church that has come to the place of maturity, the finished work in the body of Christ, bringing him to the place of the mighty finished work of the Lord. Then we come to Psalms 46. You must understand the days that we are in, as we've talked about. Psalms 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Trouble going on in the world, and trouble is going to continue to go on as we're going down these last 10 years, approaching the end of the church age. At the same time, the work is going to be done in the church to bring it to maturity and to be the glorified church. Therefore, will we not fear, though the earth be removed? You know, that sounds like a bunch of earthquakes. And though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, earthquakes, volcanoes, all these kind of things happen, we're not going to be afraid. Though the waters therefore roar, thereof roar and be troubled. Remember, it talks about in Luke chapter 21 about the raging and the roaring of the seas. And yeah, we're going to see that happen more than you've ever seen. 
though the mountains shake with swelling thereof. Well, that's earthquakes, isn't it? Earthquakes happening. There's a river. That tells you that the time of this tremendous shaking is going to shake the heavens, the earth, the dry land, and the sea, you remember it talked about in Haggai. There's a river. The streams thereof which will make the city of glad, the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is coming to manifest himself in the end time church. That's what the Revelation, the seventh month, is about. We're talking about his work done in the end time church to manifest himself, to bring forth the perfected church, holy, righteous, dedicated, totally yielded to him in perfection, where the glory of God is going to be poured out. And this is the river that's going to come out of the end time church. He says, God is in the midst of her. That's right. That's why it'll happen. When God's in the midst of the church, then the glory of God will be manifested and the streams of living waters will be flowing out to the world. She shall not be moved, doesn't matter what's happening. God shall help her. And that right early, that means at the break of day. That means that this is all going to be completed right at the end of the church age, ready for the time of the seventh day, at the break of day, the beginning of that seventh day time when Jesus is going to take back the earth. The heathen raged. Oh, they will be mad. The nations. They're going to be raging because of the judgments that are going to start being poured out. The kingdoms were moved. Yeah, judgments coming on the nations. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. Now, yeah, here we see all oh, tremendous judgments that are going to be happening. The Lord of hosts is with us. God will be with his people all along. The God of Jacob is our refuge. He'll be our refuge, our protection. It'll be our place of safety as you're walking in the ways of the Lord. Come, behold, the works of the Lord, what desolations he has made in the earth. That's the judgments. These are going to be happening when Jesus unfolds, starts to unravel uh, that title deed of the earth, and he begins to undo those seals. And those seals, as they are being opened up, the opening of the seals, the judgments are going to be coming the desolations coming in the earth upon the nations and the kingdoms that have resisted him. And of course, once this is accomplished, this will be the next thing that will happen when he starts his millennial reign. He makes wars to cease unto the end of the earth. That's right, there aren't going to be wars in the millennial reign. He breaks the bow, cuts the spear in asunder, he burns the chariot in the fire. There isn't going to be any of that war any longer. Be still and know that I am God. Don't get anxious about anything. Keep your eyes on him and be right with him. I will be exalted among the heathen or the nations, and I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. That is a psalm revealing what is going to happen. The end time church coming to fruition, coming to the place of the glory of God manifest, God in our midst, the streams coming forth, of living waters out of the end time church. At the same time, the tremendous shaking and judgments that are going to come on the nations at the same time. God is going to manifest himself. That's the revelation of the seventh month. He is going to do a great and mighty work. And we have already looked in the past, Hegehi, but we're going to look just for a moment at a couple of verses before we conclude. Chapter 2, verse 1 of Hegehi. In the seventh month, that's end time, one and twentieth day of the month, that's the last day of tabernacles, right before the eighth great day, which is when the living streams, the living rivers, the living waters come forth. What's going to be happening? It's speaking to the residue, which are the remnant. Only, unfortunately, only a remnant will listen. And he says, Who's left among you that saw this house in her first glory? How do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison, but it's nothing? That's right. What's this talking about? The early church had the glory of God, but after that it was like nothing. Be strong. We're going to get strong. And we're going to be doers. The word work here is the word asaw, which means doing. We're going to be doers of the word. Get strong and be a consistent doer of the word. No fear. We're not going to be afraid of all these things that are occurring in the earth. And he says he's going to shake the heavens, 
the earth, the sea, and the dry land. A tremendous shaking will be coming as we go down these days. I'll shake all nations. Desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The end time church will be filled with the glory of God. It is going to happen. Tremendous things are ahead. This is all the fulfillment of the seventh month. God is going to accomplish this great work. In who? Those that will meet the conditions. Those that will walk in his ways. That's why you have to have the revelation of the seventh month. You can't be involved in walking in the ways of sin. You've got to come out of Babylon and all the things that are sinful. You've got to put the word of God first place. You can't be in compromise. Are you, gonna, you can't be listening to these false prophets or anybody that tells you things and be chasing that around. Because remember, the children, the ones who are followers of them, if they're not right, you're going to die just as well. They die as well. God wants you to put the Word of God first place. Look at what they did in the seventh month. They got in the Word. They wanted to hear the Word. They were studying the Word. Three hours, six hours, hearing the Word, gaining understanding, being doers of the Word, putting in operation, getting the foundation laid in their life, walking in His ways. That's what God wants for every single one of us. And I trust that you have ears to hear and you understand the revelation of the seventh month is all about the end time work coming in the body of Christ to bring it to the place of maturity, to perfection, walking in the ways of the Lord to be the glorious church in these last days where the living streams flowing out to the whole world to reach people, to see people be one to the Lord and come to walk in the ways of the Lord, be set free from bondages. The glorious church will rise in these last days. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the revelation of the seventh month, seeing this mighty work of Jesus Christ began when, first of all, when he, we see the declaration of the, the end of the evil in the seventh month, and we see Jesus coming, being born in the seventh month, at the time of tabernacles, we see him beginning his ministry to bring liberty. We see them then the things that would happen as the people would get the word of God in them and build the foundation, be hearers and doers of the word. We also see what's going to happen for those that aren't walking in the way of the Lord. They're going to be in trouble. Those that are false prophets are going to die. Those ones that are walking in compromise in the way of sin, they're going to see destruction. They're going to be killed as well. Father, I thank you that you're bringing every person to understand they must put the Word of God first place, be hearers and doers of it, grow up in all things, conquer in all areas, and come to the place of being in one accord, the one man, the, the, who are going to see the glory of God poured out in these last days. Father, we thank you for each one putting the Word of God first place, walking uprightly before you, conquering all sin and everything that would come against them, and not letting anything disrupt or hinder the building of the house of God in their life. Thank you, Father, for accomplishing this great and mighty work in every single person's life to see the fulfillment of the seventh month revelation, the perfection of the church, coming to the place to be ready for the outpouring of the glory of God mightily on the end time church to see the living waters, rivers of living water flow forth. Father, we thank you for this work being done and each one as they are hearers and doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.